I am with you always until the end of the world. Good evening. <clears throat> I'd like to dedicate today's session to everyone who's in Christian mission around the world. I want to dedicate it to those who teach, those who preach, those who lead worship, and those who serve the kingdom of God in many ways. It is not easy to do what they do. Because every single day of their lives, they're attacked by the enemy. And many times they're wounded. Many times they fall. But despite whatever happens to them, despite all the injury, despite all the humiliation, despite all the attacks they face, they stand up and they continue to walk. And for this, I salute them. And I ask you to salute them too. Today we pray a special blessing upon everyone who preaches, upon everyone who teaches, upon everyone who does anything whatsoever for God's children, that they be protected from the enemy. And no matter what happens in their lives, they always remember that God loves them dearly and always will. Amen? Okay. Today we're going to continue our series on the armor of God, and we're going to look of the armor that we need to wear. Because if we want to do battle with the enemy, and more importantly, if we want to walk in victory, walk in triumph, we need to be dressed for war. I've said these words in the first session I did, and I'm going to repeat them again. Listen very carefully. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is the Word of God. Put on 
Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. I watch my brothers and my sisters being shot down. I watch them as they fall wounded, struggling and crying for help. I watch them as they beat themselves up thinking they're unworthy. Believing sometimes that they are useless and many times wanting to quit. And then I watch and marvel as they pick themselves up, bruised and wounded and continue to fight. I salute them. Because I know what it feels like to be in this war, to be hammered, not once in a way, but every single day. To be assaulted physically, to be assaulted emotionally, to be assaulted mentally, to be tempted, to be blasted, especially when you're weak, and to claw yourself back up and stand up, just as Paul advises after everything to stand. I know what the leaders go through, but then I also know what you go through because it's pretty much the same. Arrows are being fired at you constantly, arrows of doubt, arrows of challenge, arrows that say you're a hypocrite, Arrows that say you're useless. Arrows that say you're unholy. Arrows that say you will never make it. Arrows sometimes that even say, why are you doing this? Because God does not exist. I know you feel it. I understand. And more importantly, God understands. But he's saying, I have an answer. Listen carefully. Put on my armor. What do you look like to the devil? You sometimes worry about that, don't you? What do you look like to the devil? He looks at you and he sees weak, helpless, miserable human beings. Have any of you seen a Batman movie? You have, I'm sure you have. Get the slide up. There are about seven people that I know of who played Batman. Which one of them is that? You can't tell. You can't tell because even though they might be flabby people, even though they might be skinny people, even though they might be weak people, once they put on that mask, you don't know who they are. So I'm telling you, the first secret of warfare, put on the armor of God. And when you stand in the armor of God, understand that you're wearing the armor of God himself. And when the devil looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees God. Because this armor, it's not human armor. This armor is the armor of God himself that Jesus wore when he walked upon this earth. So what is this armor? Paul used a Roman soldier, kind of like the soldier we see there. He's not very frightening. But the Roman soldier of his time was the most frightening fighting machine in the world. When the Roman army went on the march, the enemy trembled because they were a formidable fighting force. As a group, 
but even as an individual. And one of the reasons they were the fighting force that they were was because of what they wore. They wore a belt with leather strips on it. And on the leather strips were attached metal thongs. The belts secured their apron. It also served as a scabbard for their sword. And when the soldier marched, there was a jangle and a clanging. And people would hear that clanging. And knowing that the Roman soldier was about to come, they would start to shake. Then they had a breastplate that protected his chest. And this breastplate was a series of plates that allowed the soldier flexibility of movement and also gave him tremendous protection. There were shoes called caligae, which were made of leather, very comfortable, very worn. And with them, the Roman soldier could go on for hours on the march, something very needed. He carried the shield, which was a huge thing that served to protect the entire soldier. Any time danger threatened, all the soldier needed to do was to crouch and let the shield cover his entire body. He had the helmet, very strong, very powerful. And then he had the sword with which he would make the enemy flee. Now Paul used this soldier to describe the weapons that we need to wear. And we're going to look at them one at a time. Let us first look at the belt which is spiritually the belt of truth. I've lost a lot of weight lately. Can you tell? Am I looking good? I love her. You know, I need to take her with me whenever I go on mission. You know, I just need to make her sit there in the front row and I know everything's going to be fabulous. <laughs> Some people lose a lot of weight and they secure their pants with their belts. And if the belt is broken or is missing, half the time they're pulling their pants up. Have you seen that? I know you've seen people like that. You know, they'll kind of pull it up like that and they pull it up like that. Now imagine you go to war. Yeah. <laughs> and you're fighting with somebody and he's coming at you like this and, and you're going like this instead <laughs> how do you think you're going to be the devil <laughs> will die maybe but he'll die laughing at you <laughs> we need to have our belt on when we go to war. And the belt we need to wear is the belt of truth. Now for the Christian belt, there are three links. One is the link of truth in word and deed, which is the opposite of falsehood, which basically means we need to be honest people, not only in what we say, and not only in what we do, but even in what we think. The second link that holds the belt together is honesty of heart, which is the opposite of hypocrisy, which basically means that we should be the people we claim to be. And the third link, which is the most important link, is truth in Jesus, who is the absolute truth. Do you believe in Jesus? He says, I am the truth which means that everything that he says is true. And we need to have that belt secured around our waist firmly and strongly. Now, there is something I learned very early in my Christian life about truth, and I want to share that with you, even though there's a good chance I've shared it with you before. Imagine everything that you do. Okay, I want you to start doing this from now on. Imagine every single thing that you do, every single thing that you say, and even every single thing that you think 
was flashed on a screen just like this for the entire world to see. Ask yourself, would you still say it? Would you still do it? Would you still think it? I know she is my good friend, aren't you? She's blushing. Ah. <laughs> but imagine she is not my good friend. She doesn't like me very much for whatever reason. And she and she are talking. And my good friend tells her what a wonderful person I am. But she is not a very good friend of mine, so she tells her the opposite. Now she can do this. Why? Because I'm not watching. I'm not listening. If she, however, were to imagine that whatever conversation they were having is being flashed on a screen where not only I can see it, but all of you can see it, would she still do it? This is something for all of you. In the privacy of your homes, where sometimes there is nobody watching, would you do something if you knew that everything you were doing is being displayed for the world to see? In your offices, when you're about to leave home and you realize you maybe need stationery to use in your printer. Okay, I touched something over there. Would you still take that paper or that safety clip, that little, little clip there, if you knew that the moment you reached out for it, zoop, it comes there on a screen and there are 350 people watching you take it. Would you still do it? And if somehow your thoughts, your thoughts that are secret and you think nobody knows and nobody will know because nobody can see behind that veil, would you still think what you're thinking. And my God, my brothers and sisters, you live a week like this and see how your life starts to change. Just think the next time you speak, the next time you think, the next time you do anything, that your words, your actions, and your thoughts are going to be seen by 350 people sitting here. I am telling you, you will not do it. And that's the way to live. Truth. Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth just doesn't set us free. Knowing the truth sets us free. And whenever we're conscious about the things that we do, what do we do? We go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I have a problem here. And you bring it out into the light. When you were little, did any of you ever go to a forest? or a rough ground and take a rock out? And did you see the little white ants that lay over there that kind of went darting in all directions? Have you seen that? You have, good. Our lives are like that. There is so much within us, so much within us that we have hidden, that we have placed a rock over because we don't want anyone to see it, not even ourselves. Go home tonight, sit with God and take off the rock and see as you take out the rock, the things over there that go scampering around the place. Listen to me, in that is freedom because these people have to run for their lives. And whatever it is you are concealing in your heart, bring it in front of God, bring it into the light and I'm telling you, it will run. No more power to the enemy, not here, not tonight, not ever. I knew God was going to do something good today. As I was sitting back over there, he has these conversations with me. And he said he's going to do something even he has never done before here. So I'm really looking forward to an amazing evening. And if necessary, we'll continue to 11 o'clock. Is that okay with you? Yes. Good. I'm not, but good. <laughs> the second element in the armor is the breastplate of righteousness. And I spoke about this last time, but I'm going to speak about it a little more this time because it is important, truly important, that we understand what righteousness is. 
Most of us believe that righteousness is doing things that are right. And yes, a part of it is that. But if the breastplate that you wear is your righteousness, trust me when I say to you, the devil will get to you every single time. Every single time if the breastplate that you wear is your righteousness. If here I am thinking I'm good, if here I am thinking I have the right to preach to you because I live a good life, trust me, within a few hours I'll be on my face on the ground with the devil saying to me, see you hypocrite, what gave you the right to think you could go and preach? You know why I preach? Because I don't wear my righteousness. I wear the righteousness of God. And if you wear that righteousness too, understand the devil can do nothing to you. And you need to know that. You really, really need to know that. I want to read you a scripture verse because I had a long conversation about it last week. This is from John chapter 16, verse 8 to 11. Jesus tells the people that after he goes, the Holy Spirit will come. And then he said, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I told you last time, a lot of us think the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. He doesn't. And after the talk, somebody came and asked me, how do we know otherwise if it isn't the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin? Isn't that what he does? Think about a remote person in a remote village in a remote corner of this world who's never heard of Jesus. Does he know that murder is wrong? What do you think? Yes. Does he know that raping somebody is wrong? Yes. Does he know that molesting someone and lying to somebody is wrong? And the answer is yes. Because all of us have something within us that tells us when something is right and when something is wrong. We don't need the Holy Spirit to do that for us. Are you listening to me? And that is what scripture says. He does come to convict men of sin, but he convicts men of the sin of unbelief in Jesus. And all of us believe in Jesus, so he has nothing to convict us for. But what he will convict us of is righteousness. And Jesus says, because when I go, you no longer will see me. And why is seeing Jesus important? Because if Jesus was here, I've said this before, I need to say it again. If Jesus was here and you fell and you looked into his eyes, what do you think you're going to see? Condemnation? Anger? Disappointment? You will only see love. I promise you, you will only see love. Have any of you ever seen anything else in the eyes of Jesus except love after you've fallen? I would change my faith if that is the case. He picks you up. And you say, I'm sorry, Jesus. I won't do that again. And five minutes later, you're doing exactly the same thing. You turn to him again what do you see in his eyes? You will still see the same love. I have never seen anything different. And that is what the Holy Spirit will convict you of 
is when you think you're not good. When you think you're not worthy. When you buy into the lies the enemy tells you when he let his arrows fly and they hit you all over the place, you say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good because I don't wear my righteousness, which is like rags. That is what the prophet Isaiah said. You know, some of us go in front of God saying, I'm righteous, I'm holy, I'm prayerful, I'm pure. Oh man, oh man. You should really look at yourself once in the eyes of God. Paul did that. He was this super self-righteous person. He did everything that was right. He followed the law to the letter. And he really thought he was holy. Till one day he had a glimpse of himself through the eyes of God. And he said, my God, you look so rotten. So what are you wearing here? How many times do you pray a day? Two hours, three hours, four hours? How many times do you go for mass? Every day? Twice a day? How many times do you go for confession? How much do you listen to God? How much do you try to please Him and you think that makes you right? Yes. Look at yourself now for one moment through the eyes of God. Do it now. Anyone here who thinks He's holy, anyone. Anyone who thinks he's better or she's better than the person next to her. Anyone. Look at yourself for one moment through the eyes of God. What do you think he sees? He sees rags. Dirty, filthy rags. Because he sees everything about you. Don't wear it. Because you know what? When you're driving home tonight, somebody might overtake you and you might swear at the guy for the next five minutes and there you'll have the devil shooting his arrow at you. Got you. And what happens to you? You're God. Trust me, you're God. How many of you married here? Never mind. All it takes is your husband or your wife to say one little thing. One little thing. Got you. That's my wife. <laughs> Are you enjoying this? Are you learning something here? The third element in the armor of God are the shoes of peace. You know when a soldier is fighting a war he doesn't take his shoes off. Did you know that? He sleeps with his shoes on. And the reason for that is if war starts, if the enemy suddenly attacks, he doesn't have to spend time in the dark looking for his shoes and putting them on and making sure they're tied properly, he's ready to jump and fight. And that is what we need to wear. Our gospel shoes, which are the shoes of peace. How many of you are at peace now? Don't answer. Ah. You can't walk. You can't run. You can't do anything. All you can do is look miserable, which most of you are looking. Okay, I see smiles on your faces now, but a moment ago you were looking very miserable. But that is okay. I'm here to teach you how not to look miserable. One day Paul and Silas were in Philippi, which was a little city in Macedonia, preaching the word of God. And as they went about preaching the word of God, there was a slave woman who followed them, saying, Behold, here are the servants of God. And they do a little more, and Behold, here are the servants of God. And then the next day, they're still going about preaching the word of God, and she goes, Behold, here are the servants of God. 
I mean, if I was Paul, I'd have turned and give her one slap, but never mind, you know. Paul was a very patient man, but after three days, his patient ran out. And he turned to the woman and said to the spirit within her, because he knew there was a spirit, and said, spirit, get out. And spirits have to listen, so the spirit got out. Which you think was a good thing, right? Except this woman had an owner who used to make a lot of money because of the woman's fortune telling. She had gifts within her, thanks to the evil one. And she used these gifts to get a lot of money for her owners. And now, basically, the owners lost their goose that laid the golden egg. So they got very upset with Paul and Silas. And they trumped up some charges and had them brought before the magistrate who ordered that they be beaten. So they were taken and they were beaten, not with sticks, but with iron rods until they were bruised and bleeding. Then he ordered that they be thrown into a dungeon, deep and dark, and their feet put into stocks. So they were taken, these two men were taken into this dungeon and they were put in stocks. You know what stocks are? They're these little, the, there's this wooden board with these two holes in them and your feet are basically shoved in them. Can you picture that? And their hands were tied in chains. Now I really need you to be Paul and Silas for just one minute. It is dark. It is gloomy. Your body is hurting because you have just been beaten mercilessly. You cannot move. There is the stench all around you of despair and decay. All around you, you hear the sounds of mourning and groaning from prisoners who are in a similar condition as you. What are you going to do? Yes or no? Lord, where are you? I'm preaching your word, Lord, and look what they've done to me. No. Half a minute. Paul and Silas don't complain. Paul and Silas, they don't groan. Paul and Silas, they don't moan. Paul and Silas start to sing. Sing alleluia to the Lord. Better than that, I'm sure, but they sang. Why? Because they had on the gospel shoes of peace. Peace that Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I give as the world does not give. Do not be disturbed. Do not be afraid. My peace, my peace I give you. Do you have it? I've been very sick for the last week. Only the people very close to me would know. Last night I had a terrible headache, kind of headache I haven't had since the days before my conversion. Today morning I woke up feeling like death warmed over. During the course of the day I heard, out that, I heard that somebody in India was sending letters to bishops and priests telling them bad things about me and my ministry. Just before I came here, I couldn't find my wallet. And that contains all my cards and everything I have. It was a bad day that ended a very bad week. And I sat in the car feeling, <laughs> feeling like Paul and Scylla should have felt sitting in the dungeon with their feet in stocks and their hands tied to chains. But then, fortunately, I'm blessed with some wonderful people who know what to do in situations like this, and they started to sing. And within a few minutes, just like what happened to Paul and Silas, you know what happened to them? As they were singing, an earthquake shook the place the chains that held them 
broke to the ground. The door that held them prisoner was broken open and they were free. In just a few minutes. Yes. In just a few minutes, I was free. The gospel shoes of peace. Not my peace. Not your peace. Not the kind of peace you get when you sit in a room with a blue carpet and with all money, whatever, coming from the rafters. No, the peace of God that comes from understanding his peace. He says, do not be disturbed. Do not be afraid. And you don't have to be. Are you listening? Wear those shoes. The next time your peace is threatened, and it's going to be threatened constantly, wear those shoes and see how you feel. Then we come to another item of armor, which is the shield of faith. Pick up the shield of faith. As I just told you, the shield the Roman carried was big. And it protected his entire body if he just crouched down under it. Now all of us say we have faith, don't we? But our faith needs to be exercised. You know, if I'm a soldier and you come to fight with me and I have a shield, but my shield is there in the corner, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to fight. I got nothing to protect, right? I need to go and pick up that shield. I need to place it in front of me and then you shoot whatever arrows you want. Where are they going to land? They're not going to land on me. They're going to land on my shield. And what is my shield of faith? It is faith in God and faith in God's promises. It is faith that God is a good God, that he's a merciful God, that he's a compassionate God. It is a faith in God's grace that he continues to shower upon us. It is faith in God's promise that he has given us victory and victory that we need to claim. And that is all that we need to do is to cover ourselves with the shield. And then when we're defending ourselves, take that damn sword out of its cabin and go to war. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Do you remember the time Jesus was tempted in the desert? The devil came to him and said these things to him. What did Jesus say? Ah, huh, sorry, I read somewhere about cake. No, no, it wasn't about cake. It was about bread. No, no, it wasn't about bread. What was it? And where was it? No, he said, it is written. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Next time the devil comes to you and he attacks you, you attack him back. Not by, not by, saying things in your mind or not by praying in your mind, open your mouth and say, it is written. I give you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. You will overcome all the enemy. Nothing has the power to harm you. Those shoes that you're wearing has the power to crush the devil underneath your feet. Do you believe? Say it is written then. Are you afraid? Are you anxious? Are you disturbed? Say, it is written, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave you. I give you peace as the world does not give. Do not be disturbed. Do not be afraid. This is the power of the word of God. I told you there's going to be healing here today. I told you we're going to leave you victorious today. Why? Because God is going to do something new? No. Because you're going to do something new. You're going to leave you understanding that victory is not something that has to be obtained. You're going to leave you understanding that victory has already been won. And you will go forth as conquerors out there in the world. And conquer. I don't mind picking up my brothers when they're broken. I don't mind wiping the tears from my sister's eyes when they're hurting. But what I really would like to see 
are my brothers and sisters. Walking tall, walking proud, with their shoulders square. I want to see happy Christians, not miserable, anxious, and afraid Christians, but scared of every sound they hear. I want us to walk like warriors on this earth, because that is what we are. Pick up the armor of God, put it on. Don't forget the helmet of salvation which guards your mind. I already spoke about this last week, so I don't want to go into it again. But when you're clad like this, understand you look like Jesus himself to the devil. And can you imagine what he will do when he sees you looking like Jesus? He won't even fight. He will run. But he needs it on. He needs the belt on. He needs that sword fastened to it, ready to be taken out and used which means you need to know the word of God. You can't say, I think this, or you can't say, I know that is there somewhere. You need to be able to say, it is written. It is written that victory has been won. Say, it is written. The battle belongs to the Lord and he has the victory won already the only question is are we going to claim it next time I'm here I'm going to talk to you about how to command and conquer 